have cycles in our life that need to be broken. If this is your first time at Mountain Movers, we want to tell you, welcome home. You're only a guest one time in our family, in our home, and in our church. Welcome home and welcome all of our online family. Today we're going to be looking in part two at generational cycles. So today is part two of breaking the cycle in your life. Cycles can be carried down from generation to generation. All right, this can be seen really clearly in a song that my dad actually sings to me from time to time when he calls me, and I'm so busy, and, and it's, it's hard to take time to talk to him. If, if you guys have been around for a while, back in 1974, this song was really, really popular, Cats in the Cradle. How many of you guys have ever heard that song? Raise your hand. So I want to read the lyrics to you this morning. For those of you especially who are not familiar with the song, I want you to hear the lyrics of this song and just hear how this rings so true for many of us that get so, so busy from generation to generation. It says, A child arrived just the other day. He came to the world in the usual way, but there were planes to catch and bills to pay. He learned to walk while I was away. And he was talking before I knew it, and as he grew, he said, I'm going to be like you, Dad. You know I'm going to be like you. My son turned 10 just the other day. My, he said, thanks for the ball, Dad. Come and let's play. Can you teach me to throw? I said, not today. I, ha I got a lot to do. He said, that's okay. And he walked away, but his smile never dimmed, and he said, I'm going to be like him. Yeah, you know I'm going to be like him. Well, he came from college just the other day, so much like a man, I just had to say, son, I'm proud of you. Can you sit for a while? He shook his head, and he said with a smile, what I'd really like, Dad, is to borrow the car keys. See you later. Can I have them, please? I've long since retired. My son's moved away. I called him up just the other day. I said, I'd like to see you if you don't mind. He said, I'd love to, Dad, if I could find the time. You see, my new job's a hassle, and the kids have the flu, but it's sure nice talking to you, Dad. It's been sure nice talking to you. And as I hung up the phone, it had occurred to me he'd grown up just like me. My boy was just like me. It's a really sad commentary of how life gets so busy. And as you can see clearly through the song, you know, uh, dad is so busy doing life, trying to be the dad, trying to provide for his family that he just doesn't quite make the time for the things that are most important. He doesn't take that time to, to, to spend with his son, to play ball with him and to just go fishing and, and maybe just do what dads and sons do. And he gets so caught up doing that, that that life slips him by. And before he realizes that his son is full grown and he's moving out of the house and he's going to college and, and you see a cycle begin to take place of just busyness and really not taking the time necessary to invest and make those deposits into your children so that you can really pour into them so to help them become the people that you want them to be. It's, it's a sad commentary, but it's so true. And that's just one example of one cycle that we see so common in today's culture. Many of us, though, we selfishly live only for today. And we don't understand how our choices and our habits and our cycles eventually catch up with us and they're passed down from us to our children, to their children, to their children's children. And, and I'm just talking about busyness right now. What, what about poverty, alcoholism, drug abuse, crime, pride? And there's good cycles too. You know, some parents pass on to their children to do good for others and, and to be thoughtful and to be respectful. And those things are passed down as well. But what we really want to bring to the forefront of today's message is that cycles are passed down, good and bad. And the question is, what cycles are being passed down through your family? I want to begin in Exodus 20, verses 5 through 6, because the Bible reminds us uh, that, that, uh, that it's important to think generationally not just personally. We, a lot of times we'd only think about, and tell me if this is true, we tend to only think about ourselves and how our actions and our habits and our lifestyle and our dreams, our ambitions, really only affect us. Where we decide to live, where we decide to work, the people we decide to surround ourselves with, we really only think about how ourselves and how our decisions are going to impact us. But how selfish is that? Instead, how we should think is generationally. How are my decisions and my lifestyle and my habits going to affect not me only, but also my children 
and my children's children and their children. It's amazing when you think about the domino effect of cycles and the effect they have upon generations. Exodus 20, verse 5 through 6 says, You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected. If you're writing in your word today, underline that part right there. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected. Even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commandments. Think about this. It's easy to believe from this scripture that God simply punishes those who disrespect him and bless those who love him. But God is not a vengeful and angry father who intentionally punishes uh, great-grandchildren for the sins they've committed generationally. Uh, but a better way to understand the scriptures is to realize that, that, that family dysfunctions and their consequences are passed down from parent to, to child, from generation to generation. Curses are the result of breaking God's law, and, 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 and many uh, sins are perpetuated to the next generation by the poor example of the previous generation. Isn't that powerful? Some of us come from family backgrounds of defeatism, divorce, uh, pessimism, selfishness. Think greed, anger, addictions, laziness. And unless we break the curse, these traits will very well be passed on to our children. And one's dysfunctional personal behavior becomes a model or an example to the next generation. And the cycle can be repeated over and over and over and over again. But what you have to decide for yourself and for your family, like Joshua said, is for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You have to make a decision for you and for your family that whatever negative cycle is in momentum coming through your family that's been passed down, you have got to say the cycle is broken here. It stops with you. I want to give you an example really quick, just as a side note of other cycles. You know, my uh, my father, interestingly enough, uh, grew up in an Irish Catholic family. My mom grew up Southern Baptist. I decided to kind of fall in the middle of that. I don't really know who I am or where I belong, but I know I love God with all my heart. And, and uh, I, I say that, you know, just with humor. But, you know, my dad, growing up in, in a very strict Catholic, you know, environment, he went to a colloquial school and, 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 uh, you know, the whole nun slapping him on the hand with the ruler thing. And, you know, he did the whole Catholic thing. And, and, and he really had this, um, this conviction. By the time he got oh, a little bit older, he really felt like God was calling him to become a priest. And he always shared that with me. And my brother, interestingly enough, uh, who now has, has, has uh, passed away, always told me, you know, in, in those moments where we had opportunities to really just kind of share our heart and where we felt like what our dreams were and where— what we feel like we, we should really be doing, you know. We all have those conversations from time to time, that the things that we really would like to be doing. He always said deep down, I, I, I really, you know, I really think I should have been a pastor or been in the ministry. And sadly enough, my, my brother, and I don't mean any dishonor to him, but his life ended up, he went to college, and he was an incredible athlete, great at football, and uh, the Chiefs were looking at him, and he just liked alcohol a little bit more and liked partying and hanging out. He loved people, and he just dropped out of college about a quarter before he graduated as a senior with a business degree, and he moved away, and, and he had gotten married and had a child, and, and he ended up uh, just kind of settling in life, and he just, he just evolved into this, this habit and this lifestyle of alcoholism and, uh, and, and really, really never aspired to be the person that he wanted to be. He especially never uh, was able to see ministry uh, in his life. And, and so it's sad when you see, you know, my dad wanted to be uh, in the ministry, and my brother had talked about being in the ministry, but it just never, it never took. And, and then here I am, and, and it's only by the grace of God. I'm telling you, if you knew who I was, 
you would not believe I would be standing on this platform right now. You would not believe it. Cycles can be broken. When I think about my whole family, my extended family, everybody, you know, you, you, you look and you wonder how something good could come out of it. Great people, but, but far from God. My entire family, far from God. And then in the middle of this hopelessness, and darkness and just despair. You know, God grabs, God grabs this, this young man and grabs his heart and gives him opportunity. And the only difference between me and anybody else is I took it. And I ran with it. I said, God, I'm so sorry that I've sinned against you. I'm going to change. I'm going to live different. I'm going to think different. I'm going to be different. And I, and I ran with it. And I've never looked back. I'll, I'll never be the same again. And the cycle in my family has been broken because I made a decision to break it. And... Um, we have a couple examples this morning of, of people in the Bible who broke those cycles as well. You know, the Word of God is full of stories just like Brad's. Yeah. You can go from Genesis to Revelation, and you can see stories of God stepping into somebody's life, speaking to them, pulling them out of a pit, and breaking a cycle. You see it with Abraham. You see it with Moses. You see it all throughout the Word of God. And, you know, I think what's really interesting is how God chose to pick Brad out, and we've talked about that before, how interesting it is um, that God would choose Brad, of all people. We missed his 20-year high school reunion. It tells you how old, how old he is. But um, it was this summer, and we talked about going. Believe it or not, we were just so busy that we forgot until the day it happened, and we were like, oh, it was today. But we talked about how his life is so much different. If we went back, nobody would believe it. Nobody would believe that Brad was a pastor. But, you know, when I look in my own life, my story is a little bit different. You know, I look back and I've, I've heard the history. My mom and dad grew up Christians, and they raised me in church. Every single time the doors were open, our hind end was in a pew. Now, we didn't have chairs. We had pews. And when we were little, we'd fall asleep under them, and we mowed the lawn, and we picked up the trash, and, and that's all I knew. I mean, I was, I was in church. And at one point, as my grandma was passing away, my grandma um, had breast cancer, and as we were there with her next to her bedside, the family began to talk. And it was things I'd never heard of before, and they started talking about when grandma came to Christ. And I remember them talking about how she didn't grow up in church. And my grandma had been raised in a rough kind of home, and she married her husband pretty young, and they started having kids. And their life was just probably like everybody else's, just kind of rough and kind of miserable. And they started getting frustrated, and they decided to go to revival. There was some church was having a revival, and they decided as a couple they were going to go. And that night they went into this revival, and both of them, came home that night, knelt down together at their bedside and gave their life to Jesus Christ. From that point forward, they never looked back. And that was my mom's, my great-grandmother's, who that would have, my, my grandmother's, who that would have been. But I look at the legacy that was left because my grandparents chose to give their life to Christ. My mom chose to raise me as a believer. The same thing happened on my father's side. And because of it, a generation has been affected. Because God chose to pull Brad out of the middle of a generation of people who were not living with an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ, the future generations have been changed. Cycles have been broken. And there's hope for all of us. You know, when you look back through history, I'm not going to go through all of it for the sake of time, but there was a story about six inmates who were in prison in New York City. 
all of them from the same family. And they were costing so much. They were costing so much money to keep them in prison for all the horrible things that they had done that they began to do research to try to figure out what in the world happened with this family line? Why did we land six people at the same time in prison? And they tracked this family back to a guy who was born in 1720. And he was basically known as the town drunk. He was a troublemaker, and he was known as a very godless man. He got married to a woman that was pretty much just like himself. And in that relationship, they had six daughters and two sons. And because a cycle never broke in that family, the statistics go like this. By 1874, they had 1,200 descendants. 310 were homeless. 160 were prostitutes. 180 were drug and alcohol abusing. And 150 were criminals who spent time in prison, including seven for murder. Look at what can happen in a generation because of the way that somebody raises their children and it just is passed on and evolved. But, you know, the flip side of that is an incredible man that I read about who was born about the same time in 1702, a preacher by the name of Jonathan Edwards. And you may have heard of him. He was an incredible man of God. He married a girl by the name of Sarah, and they had 11 children. How many want to keep up with them? 11. Not me. They had 11 kids. And in those 11 kids, by the 1874, they also had tons of descendants. They had 1,400 descendants. But I want to tell you the different story in their life. In 1874, there were 13 college professors who came from this family. 65 were, were college professors. I'm sorry. 13 were college presidents. 64 were professors. 100 were attorneys. 32 were state judges. 85 wrote books. 66 were physicians. 80 held political offices. Three were state senators, and one became the vice president of the United States. I want to tell you that if you don't think cycles are passed down from one generation to the other, you have lost your mind in a very loving way. They do. You look at yourself, and you'll be able to say, man, that's what my mom used to do, and I hated it, and now I do it. Did you ever have your mother do this? Yep. And you said, stop, like I hate that. And then you find yourself doing hey. it to your kids, right? And you're my like, ears are big. My ears are big because my mother grabbed she a hold of them. them. You find yourself doing the same things. And some of it, yes, it's humorous, and some of it's not. Some of it's, it's the negative things that we find ourselves having a critical spirit or having an alcohol addiction or having a drug abuse problem or having whatever it is that's negative, pornography, all of these things. And we see it just passed down, and we tend to make excuses. And we tend to say, what's the big deal? My dad did it. My mom was like that. My grandfather was like that. What is the big deal? But I want to tell you that God has called us to step out and break cycles. And the way I always think about it is this. Do I want my child raising their child that way? Do I want my kids to take on the negative things that I have going on in my life? Do I want my kids to be like that? But so often we live just for ourselves, not really thinking about that future generation. And this morning, we're going to look at a guy by the name of King Hezekiah who broke these cycles in his life. And he did four things that were pretty incredible. But I want to tell you, he was raised by a guy. He was raised in a, in, as a king's kid, so he was a prince. His father was Ahaz, and he was the king of Judah. So he had everything he ever wanted. Money was no option. He was raised in a palace. He had, you know, fame and fortune and money. All of that was no problem. And one day his father passes away. And when his dad passed away, he had not raised Hezekiah to live for God whatsoever. He had totally turned away from God. Well, as, as you know, that in a kingdom like that, when one passes away, the next son becomes king. So Hezekiah was up to take the kingdom. And he was, he was sworn in at the age of 25, and he became the king of Judah. But the incredible thing about this guy, and the reason I love his story, is because he decided to do something different than what his father had done. Even though everybody in the nation, okay, it'd be like somebody taking over the presidency. And we've had the United States of America running in one way for a long time. And all of a sudden, we have a new, incredible, godly president. And he steps up and says, hey, listen up, United States of America. We will serve God, the one true God. Everybody this Sunday, 
is to be in church. Now, just imagine how America would go with that, okay? Judah had completely turned away from God. So when Hezekiah stepped up, that's exactly what he did. He decided, I'm going to break the cycle not only in my own life and for my own family, but I'm going to break it for an entire generation and an entire kingdom for all the people of Judah. He did four things. We're going to show you really quick this morning what Hezekiah did. And I think to paint the picture, you need to understand that in that day and time, I, idol worship was really, really prevalent. So if they, if they weren't serving the one and only true God, they were worshiping idols. A lot of the other surrounding nations were serving idols. And so these idols were like statues. Some of them were in the form of poles that, that had a representation of the different gods. And um, it was very, very prevalent in all these surrounding countries. And, and people would worship these statues, and they would burn incense, and they, they, would, would, sacrifice they would sacrifice their own sacrifice children. The, they, they in would, honor of their God. One of the particular gods, uh, they, they would sacrifice their children to him. And uh, there's, there's one actual oven that they had built out of iron that were in the shape of hands. And there was a kiln inside of it. And they would lay their babies uh, inside of the hands of this God. And they would watch their babies. They, part of the sacrifice was to watch their children smolder and burn, hearing the screaming and the cries of this infant burning in the hands of this iron God with uh, the smoldering ashes and, and the coals all around. And, and, and they were to stand there and not shed a tear. And if they were to be able to watch this and not cry, then their offering by this false God would be accepted. It was just total and complete perversion driven by Satan himself. So there were all these idols all over Judah, all over the land. They had brought these idols into the temple. They brought these idols to the high places of the land. You could see throughout the landscape, uh, all the high places where they before were praying to the most high God. Now they were worshiping these idols. So when Hezekiah came to power as king, verse, verse 2, verse 1 and 2 shows us in chapter 29, really what Hezekiah was all about. It says he was 25 years old when he became the king of Judah, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. Listen to verse 2. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, just as his ancestor David had done. Now, David was way before, way, way back before Hezekiah. Now, his father did not serve Almighty God. His father was an idol worshiper. Okay, but something inside of Hezekiah said, I am going to break the cycle. I'm going to do something different. I don't care how I was raised. I don't care what habits were, were poured into me or what cycles are set before me. I'm going to please the Lord my God. I'm going to do whatever it takes. And so we see in verse 3, in the very first month of the first year of his reign, Hezekiah reopened the doors of the temple of the Lord and repaired them. He summoned the priests and Levites to him at the courtyard east of the temple. He said to them, listen to me, you Levites, purify yourselves and purify the temple of the Lord, the God of your ancestors. Remove all the defiled things from the sanctuary. Our ancestors were unfaithful and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord our God. They abandoned the Lord and his dwelling place. They, they turned their backs on him. They also shut the doors to the temple's entry room and they snuffed out the lamps. They stopped burning incense and presenting burnt offerings at the sanctuary of the God of Israel. That is why the Lord's anger has fallen upon Judah and Jerusalem. He has made them an object, an object of dread and horror and ridicule. And as you can see with your own eyes, the cycle needed to be broken. So what did Hezekiah do? He absolutely put into place immediately reopening the temple so they could worship God. Hezekiah knew the first thing that needed to happen is they needed to be in God's house. They needed to be back in the house of God. So true. He realized that God's presence had to be his priority. He realized there was something about worshiping in the house of God and pulling God's people together and offering praises to his name that was going to be the, the, the very beginning, getting the momentum going for, for breaking the cycle in his life and in the life of his countrymen. 
And that's what I did in my life. When, when I really dedicated my life to the Lord at the age of 19, I said, I, I made a decision within myself. I'm going to be in God's house. I'm going to be at church every single time the doors are open. And, and at my church, uh, we had church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. We had revivals. I mean, we had church all the time, right? And so I knew that I had to do something different than what I had done before if my life was going to be different. I knew that in order for things to change, I was going to have to change. In order for my life to get better, I was going to have to get better myself. The definition of insanity you guys have heard probably a million times is doing the same thing over and over and over and expecting different results. If we want the cycles to be broken in our lives, we've got to change. And the first step and breaking this cycle was getting in the house of God. Shelby and Clayton, Maine, wonderful family in this church. I've watched them over the years and seen God do amazing things in their family. The, the, the first few times he attended, I thought to myself, this is not going to last. There's no way. There's no way. Man, they were, their life was so rough and so messed up. And, and I, I tell you when, when you look at what God has done, you're just absolutely amazed amazed at how he gets a hold of people's lives. But here's what did it. He, 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 offered, he uh, called me and said, Brad, let's go out to dinner, and, and I want to talk to you. I want to ask you a question. And he said, hey, I want to, I want to have what you have. I want to be happy. I want God in my life, but I don't know what to do. What do I do? And, you know, I said, you know, Clayton, the, the, and, and, and Travis was with us, as a matter of fact, at that dinner. It was Travis and Clayton. And, and I said, you know, the Bible is, like 1,600 pages in my Bible, and there's a lot to learn right there, but I'm going to make it really simple for you, okay? Really, really simple. Be at church every time the doors are open, and make no negotiations about it. Don't let anything or any person get in the way of you being in God's house every single time, Sunday mornings, Wednesday nights, because both days have a purpose. Sunday mornings is to come together as a group openly and worship God. Wednesday nights is to get to know one another and go deeper in God's Word. Two totally different days for two totally different purposes. And when you do both, you begin to climb that ladder of spiritual maturity, and your life will never be the same. And you know what? He did it. I didn't think he would do it. He did it. I'm like, I cannot believe. So the next week, he was there. Wednesday night, he was there. Next Sunday morning, he was there. A year went by, and they hadn't missed one service. Now you're thinking, these people are nuts. Let me tell you what happened to them. Their life has never been the same since. God has blessed them. They had they had a house now. When they didn't have a house before, God blessed them with a house. But listen, it burned down. You're thinking, oh my gosh, that's horrible. They, they came into a situation where they were renting, and they needed a house. They needed transition. The house burned down. The insurance money allowed them to remodel the house. They got a brand new house, and they just closed on it this. They will close on it this next week. Do you know somebody, they, they needed a car, and do you know God provided a car? And when I say provided, I mean a family gave them a car that had sat in the garage and had low miles and was like in perfect condition. A car, people. God bless them over and over. There's, and the list goes on and on and on and on. Why? Because they made God first in their lives and made no negotiations about it. They've been in God's house, and the rest has just followed. They started praying every day. They started getting in their word. They started making new relationships, and their life just started coming together. You ask them today, and they will tell you they are happier now than they have ever been. They did what Hezekiah did. They reopened the temple in their, in their lives, and they made God's house a priority. The second thing that Hezekiah did is he just responded radically. Hezekiah destroyed everything that would displease God, and we have to do the same thing. When I came to Christ, I had to make a survey in my mind of everything that was in my life that didn't belong. I had to make a list of all these things that could displease God. And I just started have, I just went down in my, through my life and just started checking them off. I was living with a, with a woman, and I said, okay, move out. Check. Did that. All right, so I, I moved in with a, a, a man of God roommate. He was looking, it just so happened, right, that he was looking for a roommate at the time. And, and, and let me tell you, just as a side note, that when you take a step for God, 
when you're not living for God and you take a step and say, God, I'm stepping out and, and I want to live for you, he paves the path before you. You don't have to worry about what's ahead. You don't need to worry how, about how it's going to work out. You don't need to worry about those things. You just need to step out. The illustration I like is, is Indiana Jones. I don't remember which one it is, but he's, he's, he's looking out across this big, dark gorge, and, and, and he just he, he, he realizes after he flings the rice out there that there's, a, there's an invisible bridge. And he just, even though it's invisible, he just steps out. And it supports him. And, that's, and God does the same thing. When you make a step towards God, God will be the ground beneath you. He'll be exactly what you need. So I just went through my life. I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sever myself from all the old relationships. Let me tell you something. Are you listening this morning? You cannot keep the old relationships in your life and think you're going to be able to live for God. Did I make that clear? I see it as a pastor over and over and over, time and time again. People think that they can live for God and still have the same old friends that are doing the same old things. And I'm telling you, I've never seen it work for anybody. Never. So if you want to try to be the exception to the rule... <laughs> Go ahead and try it if you think that's the wise thing to do. The Bible says, do not be unequally yoked with non-believers for a reason. Because you don't have the same vision. You don't have the same future. You don't have the same plans. And two people that have different directions in their life can't be yoked up together and get anything done. If you know what a yoke is, two people side by side. And the yoke connects them by their necks. And it's supposed to be you moving forward in the same direction to plow so that you can plant seeds so you can produce a harvest. And I'm telling you that when you're linked up with people in your life that are not moving in the same direction towards the destiny and purpose of Jesus Christ, they are moving a different direction and you will just be pulling yourselves apart constantly, not making any headway, not plowing any ground, not seeing the fruit of any harvest in your life. Separate yourself. Do what you need to do in your life. Respond radically. Amen. You know, you may think to yourself, but if my friends are lost, why would I not want to be around them and bring them into what I've now found? Well, here's the deal. If I, if I were to come down here, and I, I just think I will, so you can just follow me. I'm stepping down. <laughs> right now, I'm just going to show you something. Pastor Brett, come over here. If, I'm, if, I have, if Brad accepted Christ... And he is now living for God. But I'm one of those past influences in his life, right? And I'm down here on a different plane. How much harder is it going to be for him as a baby believer to pull me up onto his level? It's going to be really hard. It would be much easier, even though I'm stronger, I mean, even though I'm weaker, to throw him back down, right? That's what we see all the time. We see it constantly over and over and over and over because it's hard. Let me tell you, breaking cycles, nobody said it was easy. It was not easy for Hezekiah to reopen the temple. It was not easy for him to respond radically and tear down all the idols that everybody was worshiping. The next thing that he did, this was not easy. He said, we're going to reinstitute the tithe and every single person in the kingdom, you are to bring your tithe and your offering to the temple. You are to bring it. And guess what everybody did? They responded and they said, yes, we agree. We're going to bring the first of every single thing that God gives us. They did it cheerfully. And the last thing that Hezekiah did that we can learn from is he served God wholeheartedly. And in the end passage in 2 Chronicles 31 and 21, it says this. In all that he did in the service of the temple of God, in all of his efforts to follow God's law and his commands, Hezekiah sought his God wholeheartedly, and he was very successful. You see, in life, if we want to have the influences we used to have, we want to hang with those old friends, we want to keep doing the things we used to do, we can do that, but we will continue to be miserable. Because when you make up your mind you're going to go in one direction, no matter what happens, I'm all out for Jesus Christ 
wholeheartedly I'm going to serve God. I have a direction. It's a whole lot easier to do that and to begin to get your life on track and God begin to bless you than it is to constantly be trying to decide, do I want to go this way or do I want to go this way? Do I want to go this way or do I want to go this way? One night I'm in the bar, the next day I'm in church. I don't know what I want to do with my life. Make up your mind because when you do, God will begin to break cycles off of your life. And Amen. as you do, you will realize that your children are being affected, that your kids are now going to change, that your grandchildren will be raised differently than you were raised, all because you chose to step up and do what was hard, and that was to break the cycles. How many of you guys want to see the cycle broken in your life and over your family? Amen. Stand with us this morning. We're going to pray. We're going to pray with you. And my, my desire right now is that the Holy Spirit would just begin to show you cycles that are present right now in your family. In your, may, maybe you've started a cycle, a negative cycle that could be passed down to your children. And you want to see that cycle broken. God can help you right now. It's your choice, but he'll help you break that cycle right now. Okay? And so we want to pray with you this morning. Maybe there's a cycle that, that, that you've inherited and, and it's, it's been in your family for generations and generations and you want to see that broken. I'm telling you, God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond what you can imagine, ask for, dream of, comprehend, or even think. God is able to do it. He did it in me. He can do it in you this morning. So if you would, bow your heads today. And I just want to see if you'll be honest with yourself, be honest with God. Be honest with me this morning. If you would say, Pastor Brad, there are cycles in my life. There are cycles in my family that I want to see broken right now. Will you raise your hand? Thank you for your honesty. Hands up all over the sanctuary today. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So we're going to pray right now that those cycles would be broken. Father God, I thank you, Lord Jesus, God, that you are the cycle breaker. God, I thank you that even though it's tough, God, to break generational cycles, God, you said, Lord, what was impossible with man is possible with God. And I pray right now over each and every individual and over each and every family, God, that you would begin to download the wisdom. God, begin to show people what the cycle is that needs to stop. Begin to give people a passion, Father God, to do something different than they've been doing. God, to see those cycles break in their lives, God, for their future generations to come. Lord, we know, Father God, if it was possible with Abraham and Moses and Hezekiah, God, it's possible with us. Lord, I thank you today that you're beginning to break off generational cycles in Jesus' name today with heads bowed and eyes closed I want to give you an opportunity if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and you want to have a real and life changing relationship with him that is contagious that can be a reality for you by admitting that you have fallen short like I did and like each and every one of us have by believing upon the name of the Lord Jesus to save you by confessing with your mouth that he is Lord by dedicating from this moment that you're gonna live for him that means going to church when the doors are open, committing to the house of God. That means surrounding yourself with godly people. It means getting into God's word and really trying to live for him and please him in all of your ways. If you want to do that, if you want a life like never before, if you want heaven as your home, I want to give you the opportunity right now. This is the portal for your purpose. This is the opportunity that God has given you today to come to know him like never before and your future will never be the same again if that's you today you want jesus you want life reconstructed you want brand new life you want happiness like can never be recreated with anything else on this planet you want jesus i'm going to count to three and when i do i want you to raise your hand that goes for you that are watching online as well you can raise your hand right where you're at are you ready one two three who are you today raise your hand be honest with the lord Amen. Who else? Amen. I see you in the back. I see you. Amen. 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 And those of you online, God sees you. I want to pray with you today. I want to pray with you to receive everlasting life, a free gift of eternity because of what Jesus has done on the cross. 
because he resurrected and overcame death in the grave, you have life. And the same power that rescued him from the grave is available to you right now. Repeat this prayer with me. Father, I love you. I thank you for Jesus. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse my heart. Make me new. I believe with all my heart that Jesus is Lord. I confess him as Lord. I dedicate from this moment forward that I will live for you, God. I will be in your house. I will read your word. I will pray to you. I will live for you. Surround me with the people that I need to make me to be more like you. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Give God praise today for salvation and for cycles broken. Hallelujah. You can text give and that is super simple. Just get out your smartphone, dial 918-223-8090, push in the amount you want to give, push in. That easy.